forward. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started today. So what we're gonna go over today is the payments menu. And that is up here underneath um, next to core. And then what this is, is like your check register. Um, how to create me, we're gonna show how to create manual checks. Uh, payee, so that would be all your payroll item um, checks. Your payroll would be your employee. Um, information for checks and direct deposits. And then also uh, a refund um, register also. So we'll go ahead and start with the check register first. Um, here, this in your grid here will show your, um, all your checks, your payroll checks. This is just payroll checks, not your direct deposit. So the check register is just showing at this time is just your checks. And then you have your check number, your payment number. Um, and again, over on the more, you still have the option where you can add more fields to your grid if you wanna see more options on that. So let's say we need to void a check for an employee. Um, we can go ahead and do that from this option, or excuse me, not void, if you wanna reissue a check from this uh, grid. So if we want to reissue a check for an employee, you can, we have the option here to void and reissue. So what this will do then is actually void this check and reissue it to the employee with a different check number. So we go ahead and do the reissue. And if you have a couple bank accounts for the districts that have different bank accounts, they will have to select which one is this coming out of. Um, but if they have one, um, then they would just select their regular bank account. Your check number, it should automatically fill in. We'll see if it does. And then um, your reissue date. And if you leave it blank, you will use the system date. So let's see if it does. And it did. So the system knew what the next check number was. So what it gave is said check number 900529 was reissued as 900530 with the issue date of 312. So it does give a little info. And then if you see over here to the far right, the one check that was voided is now has a void date as of today. So the check number changed, but the payment number did not. So that will stay the same but the check number did um, go to the new check number. And it also gives a void status here to the right. Okay. Your next option is if you want to then print that check for the employee. So then what you would do is click on print or click next to the employee, print checks, and then from here, you have that option to uh, do the X, XML, and then you also have a PDF to actually print it. So I'll just go ahead and print it. And again, you can click from what uh, form are you using? And I'm just using um, the system default one. And then go, down, go ahead and process payment. Um, Sharon, you said you could not hear me. Is that better? Is anybody else having issues hearing me? Okay. Let me know, Sharon, if you still can't hear me. Um, the next thing you would do is do the process payment. Okay, so everybody can hear me fine? Okay. So Sharon, you might wanna check your phone, uh, maybe your volume, and just let me know if you're still having issues. Thank you. And then you go ahead and then to the far left here, and my PDF, and it opens up. And as of right now, when they're printing, a re, um, reprinting a check, it's not gonna show the check stub information. Um, we do, I believe we have a JIRA issue um, 
out there that will sh add that information to the check. So um, I do believe they will eventually have that um, on there so that it will look just like your the regular payroll check. So, but as of right now, it's just, this is all it's gonna show. Okay. Okay, great, Sharon, I'm glad you got it working. So, glad you can hear me. So, we'll, um, as of that, we're done with that. So now we did that. So, um, so the next thing we'll work on is the resequence. So this option would be if you um, accidentally um, got the wrong check numbers and you need to get that resequence back in. So what we're gonna do is click a couple of these to get, just say we're gonna resequence them into a different order. So I'm gonna pick these three. So 523, 24, 25 actually need to be 31, 32, and 33. So to get it right on the system. So let's go ahead and hit resequence. Again, you would need to know what your bank account default is or what bank account that you're using. So now you're gonna, so you will need to know what is the original start number that you, um, need to resequence starting from. So we would enter in the 900523. And then what is the very last check that you need to resequence? So since I only have my three, it's gonna be 523 to 525. Now here you do need to know what the next check number is. So again, you can use your grid here to figure out what that is. So my next check number is 900531. And then here, you also have the option to void those checks immediately. So you don't have to do an extra step and go in, um, then go into the um, payroll portion of the payments, void the check then after you do this step. So here you can just do that step at the same time. So you can go ahead and enter a void date. And I'm just gonna use the same issue date that I had back in the day, or back from when I, the issue date was. Again, you can validate it first. Okay, so I got no errors. Check number 523 is gonna be 531, the 524, 532, and the 525 is gonna be 533. So once this is confirmed that this is exactly what you want done, you can go ahead and you can, you can actually, if you want, save that or print that, um, print screen. And then I'm gonna go ahead and post. So now it says it has processed my three and those are now voided and the new checks have been created. Okay, and then if you look over here, you will see those three checks have a voided date now with a voided status. And then the new ones that I created are now up here on the top. And as you can see, they still have the same process or the, excuse me, the payment number that has not changed, just the check number. Okay, so that's pretty simple. Okay, so now, we wanna say we wanna go on to the reconcile. So if you need to reconcile if one, maybe two, three checks um, in the system, you can do that from here. So let's say I wanna re uh, reconcile these three checks that I just um, printed and they clear the bank and I, I'm gonna reconcile them just on my own. So you can go ahead and click those. Then you wanna click reconcile. And what date do I want to reconcile these as of? So you can go ahead and click on calendar and click on a, um, a date that you want, or you can just use what the system date just pulls up. So up here to the far left, you're gonna see those three checks I've reconciled. I had no fails, because it will tell you if you do have a fail, and then the total amount of those three checks. 
So if you're keeping track of what your total um, amount was for all those checks you want to reconcile, it does give you a total. So then if you look here to your right, your status is reconciled, and then you also have a reconciled date. So that is how you manually reconcile those, reconciled checks on the grid. Now say, oops, those weren't supposed to be reconciled. I want to unreconcile those. So now I'm going to select those by checking next going to unreconcile and they automatically just did it on their own. It was very quick. There was no pop-up box uh, up to the left like we usually got. It just did it on its own and put them back to paid status and remove the re reconciled date. So it's a very quick, quick option. Okay. All right. Moving on. I don't see any chat. So if there's any questions, let me know on that. Um, what we just reviewed. If not, we'll go ahead and go to auto reconcile. Okay, so auto reconcile. This is how you can um, auto reconcile um, your checks that from a file that you get back from the bank that shows them that they have been cleared. So you can do a bunch of checks at once from the file. Okay. So, but before we can do that, we actually have to go and get this um, pay rec file set up. So what we would need to do is go to utilities and automatic payment reconciliation. And, oh, there we go. This is the one I have it set up on. I want to use this one. Okay, so this is where our pay rec is. We have our pay rec file. This is the, uh, what we need to create. So when we do get the file back, that file matches what we're going to be um, importing into the system. And then also we have our positive pay pay rec extract. So this is um, this tab here would be for districts. They can create the file to actually send to the bank that they can, um, the checks that they need the bank to make see if uh, what has cleared. So first we'll go ahead and set up the pay rec file. And you have two options. You have your CSV for, um, to create as a CSV, or you can do a fixed length. So either it depends on what the district wants, or maybe the bank um, has a certain way that they want that. Um, the file will be coming back from the bank. So, so I guess I think they would probably have to confirm that with the bank. Um, you have the options here to create, um, add any um, import fields that you would like. Um, here we have amounts. Um, you can put the bank account in there, check date, check day, the month or number, the check year. Um, you have your payee address, payee name, and void flag. So once you add those, and then if you do the fixed length, if you see the CSV, this right here is not highlighted, but once you change it over to fixed, it is. And I did create um, two separate ones. Um, once you do have exactly how you want this set up in your I'm just going to add a few different things here. P name, P number, check date, and amount. So once you have that set up exactly how you want it, down here to the left, you have a save. And you go ahead and save that, and you can format that to a name that, that you can um, remember. And I'm just going to do test one, and then save. Now, when you go up here to the save formats, you'll see that I have my save, my test one, and you can load it in. So if I have a different one, there we go. So if I go ahead and do test one and load, it automatically brings that in. So if you need to adjust that or make changes, 
um, you can go ahead and do that and just hit save again, put in the exact same format, test one, and it'll say, do you want to resave over? So let me do that. Let me change that to this and then save. And you can do a test again one, say we updated it. And it says a template with this name already exists. Are you sure you want to overwrite it? So from here, if, if that's what you wanted to do, you say, okay, if it was not, and you want to create a whole new one, then you would need to cancel out and resave it with a new name. So now my new test one has my update that I wanted in here. So yesterday I created some different ones that I was going to use when I'm um, pulling in um, doing the auto recognition. And what mine shows, I have check number, the amount, and the check date. I'm just going to have those three from when the bank sends the file back to me. Okay. So the other thing is the pay rec. Now, this is where um, a district can create the file for the bank, send it on to them, and the bank can um, then check it, um, check what checks are reconciled, and send back that file with the checks that are reconciled to you. And then they would use, the district would use that file from the bank to auto reconcile under payments. So again, I went in here and I already have some created. And again, you could do your fixed or the CSV. And again, you can use and create um, any extract fields um, that they would like or if the bank has certain ones that, um, that they want. So, but my, I'm gonna say my bank just wants the check number, the paid name, and the check date. And then automatically fills in the links for you in the format. So that doesn't need to be changed. Okay. And I had this set up last night. So it actually, once you have it set up, I did not have to come back here and reset it up again. So if they need, if you need to make adjustments, it should automatically save and it should be there. It should not, um, once you log out of your um, URL and come back in the next morning, this should all be, um, should stay. And then you can go ahead and um, the check date is actually what that is looking at is under check register is the issue date. So that date is looking for anything from that was processed at that issue. It's looking at that issue date. I gotta say it correctly. So if I want to pick up things back from February, I need to go back to, there we go. Oh, oh two, I'm just going to go back. So now it's going to pick up anything that's after 2-1. Um, so all the, anything that was 2-1 is going to be picked up. Again, you would need your bank account. If the bank has several different banks, then you have to decide which bank they want. And what payment transaction type do I want to send to the bank? Do I want just payroll checks this time? Do I want deduction checks? Do I want group deduction, refund of payroll item checks, or do I want them all? So again, it is up to the uh, district how they want to send that file to the bank or what checks to be included. So now they can go ahead and create the generate extract file. And here is my file that I'm going to send to the bank. Oh, I don't have the date or the amount in there. Let me redo that over. I think we'll need that. Check them out. There we go. Thought I had that all set up, ready to go. Check number, amount, and check date. Let's get rid of that. Don't want that. Check the number. Oh, check them out. There we go. That's how I want my file to look like. Oh, sorry about that. Clicked on the wrong thing. Okay. So my CSV, ah, 
Okay, it did not save. I thought it would, but it did not. And when I went out, it changed on me. Okay, so maybe that's okay. So now I'm going to generate the file. That's what I would need to be. I need the amount in there. Oh, and I changed my date 0201 2020. Because that has to be before the issue date in order for those to get picked up. There we go. That's more what I want to see. And as I look at this, I see that I don't have my decimal in there. And I kind of want my decimal to be in there. So I think I'm going to go ahead and change my check amount to show the decimal. So now if we create that again. Oh, down here. And as you can see, it included the, the decimal. So now you can see what those two files, those two different files actually were. One was just the check amount that did not have the decimal in it. And then the check amount with the decimal shows that file. So this was without the decimal. And then actually this is with the decimal. And I want the one that with the decimal. So I'm not going to save that one. Okay. All right, so now I got my file, and this is the file that I'm going to save. I can just put it to my to my desktop. Okay, and then I will go ahead and I'm going to upload that. Then you upload that to your bank, and they'll take a look at it, and then they'll send that back to the for the ones out of these that are reconciled. Okay. You also have the option to generate a report. If a district wants to keep a report of what checks they actually sent on to the bank and with a total. So you have checks extracted. It actually shows the checks that were extracted that were voided and checks less voided. Okay. I also wanted to show um, what a fixed length is. So I'm just going to go ahead and generate an extract file so you can kind of see what the difference is on that. So this is what that file looks like. Each one has a number set of spaces for a fixed. So you have your check number, you have your check amount, so they have um, how many spaces that are allowed for the check number. Um, then um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then you have that for your date. So that's what a fix is, just a fixed set of spaces that you have for your file. Okay. So I I'll say the bank's processing my stuff, and now I got a file back from them. I already set up my pay rec. So now, since I have my pay rec file, I'm going to go back to my check register. And I'm going to auto reconcile. So now you can, from here, this is what your pay rec format that we were in on that first option when we were over in systems or utilities, um, which one you created. And I want to use my CSV. And again, you can name that um, any kind of name. What default bank account? Um, again, I'm just using the system de default that I have. And then that file that the bank just sent me back this morning, say, you need that, that file. So I already got my file. Um, again, your file name might be something different that when you get it from the bank and save it on your desktop. And then I'm gonna go ahead and upload that. Keep my fingers crossed. And it worked. Okay. So now um, the file that the bank sent back to me, I was able to upload that, save it on my desktop, upload that into the system in this system, and I was able to reconcile 40 um, checks at one time into the system. And it will give you a printout, records processed, how many data errors, and again, it was processed 43, but remember we had three voids, so 40 reconciled checks. So three failed checks. So we had 
because it was pre previously voided. And then your total reconciled. So again, you can, that report that maybe you created um, in the pay rec extract before you send it on, um, you can use that report and just make sure that they, they match. Come on, there we go. All right, and again, you can do a download summary if um, your district if keeps track and prints these off. And then there, that's what the automatic check um, summary would look like. List all your check numbers, your transaction date, and your amount. And then what checks were avoided. And then if you go back, you can close out of that. You can see now that my status is reconciled for all those checks. And the reconcile date was today. Okay. Any questions on the auto reconcile for and the setup for pay rec? If there's any questions on that. Okay, all right. What we'll do then, we'll go on to our next section under manual checks. Okay, so manual checks options, um, this replace for your classic people that came from, that knows a little bit of classic, this would be your hand check option that now um, we created for, for to use. So you can create um, a payroll um, check for employee. I mean, you can't create one, but if like an employee gets maybe a payroll um, direct deposit um, partial comes back, you can use this to create a check for them um, to get that $100 that was supposed to go in savings, but it was closed. So an example that, that this is where these, um, what you would use. So um, you cannot actually process a whole employee payroll check out through this because no taxes or anything comes out of it. Um, so just a reminder on that. So your first option under manual payments would be your create. So here you have your option employee check. You have a payee check option and an other check. And again, like I said earlier, right when we came in, employee check, this is what would be a hand check to create um, a direct deposit that was um, maybe their savings account was closed and then that money came back from the um, bank, still sitting out in payroll clearance account now, and it needs to be paid to that employee for that $100. So then you would go ahead and select who your employee is, what bank account is this coming out of? Again, if they have multiple, then they would have to choose which one it's coming out of. It automatically prompts and puts in the check number for you. But again, you can change the check number. You have this option here from the arrows up and down. What date do I wanna put on that check? Do I wanna keep it for the same um, pay date as the other? check that was actually um, savings account that was voided for that payroll. And then you would put in the amount. So I'm just gonna say $100 for savings and I'm just gonna put savings closed. <clears throat> okay, so now I have a check with the payment number and then the check number it was created for my new employee, <clears throat> excuse me, for the employee. And you can see here, it is created. So if you click on it and bring up your highlight box, it would just show you um, just the information, employee's address, um, check number, what kind of check it was, and the status. Okay. Okay, so that would be an example for your employee. Now, if you had a payee check, there we go. 
a payee check would be probably maybe for, for instance, if you had a outstanding payable, you created the check, then all of a sudden you realize that this employee was not supposed to be included on that check. Instead of $5,000 going to the annuity company, it was supposed to go for $4,500. So this way you can go ahead and create a different check for the correct amount to the, to the um, annuity company. So you would go ahead and like select which one it is. So you would need to know what payee it is because that's how your payroll item configuration number is, or your, is going to come up. So you see I select different ones, it pulls in. So the payee is connected to that payroll item configuration number. So I'll just say it was this one. And then again, they would need to bring that over. So then it needs to be over here and so it was, will be picked up then. What default, again, what bank account are they using? Again, it automatically inputs the check number for me. What date do I to be in the amount? So like I said, the $5,000 that I created in the outstanding payables from the payroll is not correct. I need to put it, oh, don't tell me that, it's unstable. And then 4,500, so now I want it to be 4,500 instead. So I'm just gonna say correction minus one employee or something, what, whatever they would like to put. And let's go ahead and save and see if we can get this. And it did. So you got your manual payment with your check number, which was created. So now I have it down here on my grid for 4,500. Now, if I go to outstanding payables, I actually would have to void that check first, the one that I actually um, wanted to redo. So you would have to void that first under payee. I guess I kind of skipped over that step, apologize for that. Um, you would have to go into payee, find that payroll item for that reality, void that check, and then come over into manual checks and create it for the correct amount of 4,500. And then once you do that, then you would have to go back to processing um, outstanding payables. Because once you void that pay, um, payee check, it automatically puts it back out on the outstanding payables. So now we have a voided check, that $5,000 that I wanted voided um, is now sitting out on the um, outstanding payables. And we will have to go in there and actually use and actually go ahead and do a payables adjustment to remove that $5,000. Because we don't want that, um, that check to be cut to, um, to be sent to that annuity company. So now we have the correct amount for the 4,500 and that's the check that we want. So once you void the actual check that we didn't want them payee, they would go to um, processing outstanding payables, find that check that was um, that annuity company, and in their payables adjustment, you would need to go ahead and actually do a positive for that five thousand dollars, so it doesn't actually, so we can get it off our outstanding payables because we don't want it sitting out there anymore. There it goes. Okay. So this is where you would go ahead and find that employee um, that we had that $500 that wasn't supposed to go on there. So 
So let's say we have that employee, then you find the um, annuity company 555, and then you would do the adjustment for the employee for that um, $500 then. Okay. Okay, so we'll just go ahead and move on. Um, okay, so the 4,500 is sitting out there. And then now we'll go to other check. And the other check, uh, this would be maybe for a payroll to USAS um, if they have interest for on their bank statement and it has to get over to USAS out of the payroll count into USAS. So maybe this is what they would use for the other check. So then they can make it payable to probably to the school. Um, and then again, what bank account is it coming out of? Again, the check number will be automatically entered and the date would be the date of the check. And then how much was that interest? So maybe it was $25. And I'm just saying we're going to go to Johnny Schools, I guess, or the board, and save. So now I created a check for $25, and now um, we can get that over to um, to pay over to the USAS side. Okay. So that would be what those manual check options could be used for. All right, so the next thing we do, um, maybe we accidentally created a check and it wasn't supposed to. So the check I just created for the interest, I'm going to void that, I didn't want that. So you can go ahead and void. You can put a void date in. And you can go ahead and click confirm. Now it says that check is voided. And you see to the right here, voided date, and the amount is removed. And then, oops, I voided it, wasn't supposed to be voided. So now we can go ahead and do unvoided. So now you can see the void date was removed and the total amount is now back. Okay. So that takes care of what's under manual payments and for the create, creating of the checks and then the void or unvoiding. Okay, so then we'll go ahead and switch over to the manual payments option. The manual payment checks. So now since you created these checks, now we gotta print them. So that's what that option under manual payment checks is. So I got to print this check for the new um, annuity company with the correct amount. So we'll go ahead and print checks. Again, you have your um, export for ex or you have an actual option to print the check. You have again your option for the form. If you have several different types of forms already um, that they use and then go ahead and process the payment. And then again, it just creates the check for the payroll item code 555. Tombsboro Realty. Um, if you did an XML, um, I can show that. And then back over here. And then that's what that file would be. And that's what you would probably send to your printing, your edge. <clears throat> okay. So now we printed the check. So you would do that for the other two that we created. Um, say that we printed the check um, and the company says, we never got the check. So you wanna reissue it. So what we're gonna do is void and reissue that check so we can send it again to the company. And what that does is actually void the check. You have to know your check number. 
And then what is your reissue date? So now it took the um, old check and was reissued to new <clears throat> of 432. And it actually voided that check for us immediately. So now we can send a new check to the annuity company for the 4,500. <clears throat> and again, you have the option to resequence the checks if they're not in the right order. Um, that would be the same as what we did on the check register. So you can select the checks, go to resequence. What is your default check bank account? Your original start number, you would enter your original end number and then the new start number and then they would void them. So it's the same process of what we did prior in the check number or in the check register, excuse me. Okay, so that takes care of the manual payments under payments. So the next one is payee. And again, there are three payment payee options. You have your payee payments, your payee payment checks, and your payee electronic transfers. So again, you have underneath your payee payments, you have the option to void and unvoid. So this one shows both the transfers and your payee checks under this grid, all in one. So again, if you need to void, you can void a check from here, just like um, when you're in your hand check or check register, you select and then confirm and it will void that check for you. And then it failed because it was previously reconciled. So if a check is reconciled, um, it is not gonna let you um, void it. Void it. So I believe you would have to unreconcile it and then void it if it was. But I guess you won't be voiding a check that's already been cleared. But um, so that is how you would void checks there. And again, if it was voided and it shouldn't have been, then you just select the check that was voided and you can do the unvoid. Okay. Underneath the payee payment checks, this would be listing of all your checks. So all your deduction checks that were created will be listed under here. So again, if you need to reissue a check, let's see, I have one down here that I can reissue that's not reconciled. And you can go ahead and click on your bank, what, leave it blank and the next highest check number will be entered and what's your reissue date or leave it blank and it will enter from what the system is as of today. So I'm going to reissue. So now my new check is reissued as this new check number. And these check numbers probably were ones that came over from Classic, so that's why the check numbers are different. And then that's why now the check numbers are up in the 9,000, 900,000, excuse me. So now you see that this check was voided. Um, you can also then print that new check that I just created, which is up here on the top. Go ahead and print checks. And again, you have the same options as before, export or um, for your edge XML, or you have PDF to actually print it. And then just process. And then it creates your check for you to send on. And then resequence. Again, you have the same options to resequence your checks if they weren't in the right order. Um, so you select the checks that need to be resequenced. And then you go through your same steps as you did on the other options. Put your bank account, 
what is the original start number of what you want to resequence, what's the last number that you want to resequence, and then the um, starting number has to be entered. And do you want them voided at that time? So it, it is the same process as that, as before. Okay, so that is your payee payment checks. The next one is your payee electronic transfer. So these are all the ones that are electronic transfer set up in the payroll item configuration um, that are for your, for your payee, your de deduction companies. So let's list all of those. And again, you have the same, here you only have the option to reconcile or unreconcile. And again, electronic transfers, um, they don't automatically get reconciled. So I believe um, they would have to go in here and reconcile those and then those are reconciled because they're not like the checks. So now all my electronic transfers are, elect, are um, reconciled because um, those won't be included on your pay extract file to the bank. And then you also have the option, I guess, to unreconcile them if they need be. They shouldn't have been reconciled. So, okay, any questions on the payee portion of the payments before I move on to the employee payroll part of it? Okay, so the next one is, these are all the payroll payments. So this will be your direct deposits and your checks will be located in here. Under the payroll payments, you do have the option to void, onvoid, and print payment checks and direct deposits. So again, just like your payee, you have the options to do the same thing. So I kind of won't go through each one because um, it is, it's all this, they're both the same. And then once you void it and it accidentally was voided, you can unvoid their check. And then if you need to print the payment checks or the direct deposit again. So again, is it a check that we're printing? So if it was a direct deposit, then you can print that um, direct deposit or, um, or the check. And let's see if it lets me do it. And then it reprinted my direct deposit slip for me. Okay. Or if it was a check, let's see. And it won't because it was a direct deposit. So, so you have to um, know if it was a check or a direct deposit in order to print that. Okay, so let's move on to our direct deposits. So this grid only shows the direct deposits. So here's all my employees for my last payroll when I did um, all my pay date of 320. And from here, you can actually reissue what's your bank account and you can reissue. So the, if the direct deposit, maybe the whole direct deposit came back, um, you can actually reissue it as a check now. So then you can get this to the employee as a check and it will enter the system date. Then it brings up this little box and now we need to print it. So you would click the payroll check, click print, how do I want that? I want that in an XML for my edge laser printing, or do I just want it to be printed as a regular PDF? And I'm gonna go ahead and print checks. And again, it won't show all that detailed information that it would from originally. It just shows just the name, the amount, and the employee's name and um, address. Now, um, as you can see, this was a direct deposit. It changed to a check, what well, was voided, excuse me, in the void date. 
So now that employee is going to be showing over here on the payroll payments checks. Should be. And, three, and 374. And right there it is. So now he's going to show on the payroll payments checks grid. Took them off the direct deposit because we voided that. So now, what if we need to um, generate a new ACH file to send to the bank? We can do that from here. So you would correct, select the down arrow next to the employee, the account number, and the routing number. It will be automatically filled in, but it can be changed. And then you're going to generate the file. And then there's the ACH um, file, which would need to be re-uploaded to the bank for the direct deposit. So the option is there now that they can re-upload uh, the direct deposit back to the bank. Okay. So that takes care of our direct deposits. We'll move on to payroll payments checks. So this list on this grid will list all the checks for uh, the employee's payroll checks. Uh, maybe some employees still um, want checks instead of a direct deposit. So districts might still have employees that still want a, a hand check. So this would list all of those. Um, again, you can have the option to reissue. And again, that would void it for you immediately and reissue as a new check number. You can print the check then for that new check that you just voided and recreated. And again, you have the option to uh, XML for laser, PDF, if you just want to print out, print the check out and process payments. And again, you have the option, again, to resequence the check numbers if they were wrong. Again, it just resequence. Again, it's the same option as a payee and as your check register. Okay, so that takes care of the payments payroll. And we're going to move on to refund. Okay, this shows any refund checks that have been created for employees um, throughout the district. Um, it will always show on the refund payments grid. Okay, let me get to notes. And then um, from here on this grid, you can void or unvoid refund checks if they were accidentally set up and they shouldn't have been. Um, you can void and unvoid them from this grid. So, um, in order for a refund to show up here, you actually have to get it out on the payroll item error report. So, I'm going to go in and actually put $100 out there for a payroll item for an employee. a little slow this morning, sorry about that. Still processing. try my other one here. So let's go here. This is why I had two set up just in case.
Here we go. Okay. So now I'm just going to select, I'm just going to take my first employee I have here on the screen, and I'm going to say for um, his 601, um, he paid too much and he needs to get a refund back. So I'm going to go ahead and give him that money back. And it always will be a negative for refunds. If you need to take more out or air adjustment, um, an amount to take more money out, then you would have to do it as a positive. And then I will go ahead and save that. Okay, so now we're saved. Now, we have to actually first, before it will show up under the payments refund, is actually process it. So now we're gonna go under payroll, under processing and payroll item refunds. And now you can see my 601 employee is sitting out here. And then I wanna go ahead and click and I wanna refund selected payroll items. And again, you have the option. You can use it as a check payment, an actual check, or you have, actually have an option now that you can send this refund to, like a um, ACH electronic payment, just like you would in this payroll, and, and send it that file, create the file, and send it on to the bank. So you can have either of those options. So I want to set and leave blank for the um, highest number will be incremented in. Your issue date will be automatically entered, or you can change that by entering it or going to the calendar. Do I want it to be uh, XML for laser printing or PDF? What is my pay plan? Am I a biweekly or a semi-monthly district? And then actually gives you a file name. And again, you can change this name to um, another name if you want, if you want to put the employee's name on there. And then it did it as an XML for laser printing, and there's my file. Once I click out of that, he is gone. He is no longer on my screen. Because now, when I go over to payroll or payments under refund, and now he is sitting there. So now there's my $100. So over here in refund payments, this was my guy right here. And he also shows under checks because I created a check. Now, if I would have done the refund ACH option when I, when I was in there, like I said, that it would, you can actually create a refund ACH, then that uh, amount and that employee would show under this column instead. He wouldn't be showing on the checks because I created a check, but if I would have selected the ACH option to create a file to send to the bank and it would automatically have been deposited in his account then, instead of giving him a check, it automatically would have showed under this option. So again, you have the option then to reissue it if the check gets lost. You actually have the option to print the check. Again, you can create a laser or PDF option. And you actually have the options, again, to resequence these checks if they were in the wrong order. So pretty much all the payments have the same options. Um, they have the void, on void, the reissue, the print checks, the resequence. So they pretty much have all those options that are pretty much the same. Okay, does anybody have any questions on the refund ACH or refund checks or if they want to actually, oh, sorry, how would that show up on an employee payment screen? Okay, the refund part, then if you would go to, uh, who was my employee again? I can't remember, was it Nick? Yes, good question. I would go to Nick, bring him up, go to payments, refund payments and that's where he would show then if you do a refund to employee will that automatically adjust payable check to company if you do a refund to employee will that might adjust the payable 
Okay, so if you do a refund to the employee, no, you would have to go out then to the reports to process outstanding payables. Oh, it did. Is there's a hundred dollars? Excuse me, I was wrong. I was thinking that you would have to go out. So there, it sits out there on the payables adjustment. Then, if that wasn't supposed to, and then you don't want that to be um, take that money off the check, then you would have to do the payables adjustment. Select Nolan, select that employee. Uh, Nick, there we are. Come on, Nick. And what payroll number was that? I think that was 601. And then you do for $100. Okay. So now we did that payables adjustment for that employee for Nolan. And if we see, hopefully we go back to payables. And now it's employee no amount on there. So that's how you would remove that amount. So that way when you refund that money, um, you don't want that to be included on the outstanding payables checks. You would go to payables adjustments, do a positive for that employee for that amount for that a payroll item, and then that will remove it from your, your outstanding payables. Okay, is there any more questions on that? Those are good questions. You're welcome. All right, so then we will move on then if there isn't any other questions. Okay, so the next portion in mine is the system menu. And we're gonna go through three of the options under the system menu here. And the first one we're gonna do is the configuration. Okay, so your configuration is your options and that's under sim so your system um, these would contain your programs that um, this is how to control how the processing is defined and and done on the system and usually maybe administrator would only access these so not everybody probably at the district may have an option to um, go in and see these or um, edit them So, so what this says, um, actually this configuration is details for any of your installed modules. So any installed modules, which is located under this system. So these modules here, once we get them installed, then you can go from your configurations and do your um, view or edit them, what they should be. So like the first one, um, account mapping. Your count mapping would be like what it used to be on classic um, on your first screen. Um, what accounts do you want to be included um, from your benefit account? So do you want the employee role and the employee's instructional level to be included when they create a, a benefit account? Do you want the job um, assignment to stay the same? Do you want the operational unit to stay? Special cost center to stay or just subject? So you have that option to check these and then ones that are checked, it'll actually use what is included on their regular pay account for their benefit account um, when they're creating their benefit, like um, used to be board desk. So this would be their setup. So again, um, the district can decide what dimension should be carried forward when they're posting a benefit. Um, like I have the OPU checked here. Um, so this means that that benefit, when a benefit account is created, when we're running um, employee, I can't think now, when you're creating the employee distributions, um, the user would like the OPU um, that was used to charge the regular account with the employee had um, in his payroll, and they want that OPU to stay the same. So they want that carried through, through all those benefits, benefit accounts. Um, if the special cost center flag was marked, 
then um, all the special cost centers um, under the 9,000 mark. So if the special cost center on the employee's account is 9,000 or greater, then the special cost center um, will automatically be carried through for all the benefits. So again, um, probably the treasurer would have a hand in this also to make sure that they're not create have all because if you have all of these checked, then it's going to be creating tons of accounts. And I'm sure the treasurer is not going to want that. So again, they probably work together through the office to make sure um, what what accounts what what part of the account do they want to carry through when they create when they run the employer distribution. And again, it's up to the district of what they want. Um, created or what if they don't. So it just depends. Okay. The advanced sick leave option. Um, this is if the district is using the advanced sick leave, if a district, not all districts give advanced sick leave days. So if they do, they would use this option. Um, again, the advanced sick days, I can show you exactly where that would be. Wow, that's pulling up. What this fiscal year means for the period options is this district has an option to automatically, the system will know when it hits the new fiscal year in July, it automatically will update those um, and reset them to zero. So the district doesn't have to go into all the employees and reset their leave to zero for those advance amounts. There we go. So what that is, is this advance units used. That's what it's going to reset at the beginning of the fiscal year to back to zero if they are using it. Now they do have the option to do calendar year or they can create their own custom period and say, from October to October, we give them days. And then we want it to reset back to zero at that beginning of November or, so again, that, um, it's up to the district how they want to do that. Okay. The next thing is the advanced payoff. Is the district allowing a payoff of the advanced balance? What that means, if it is checked, is it available or available only once? So if they have it checked, then it's always available. They will never change. So the accumulations, when they do accumulations monthly for like 1.25 for sick leave, that accumulation will, um, will decrease the advance used amounts here. So saying they use 10 out of their 10 max leave. So when they accumulate for the next month in 1.25, so that 1.25 is gonna take off that um, amount and take it down to 8.75. So now they have another 1.25 days to use for sick advance used. So if they have that advance of payoff, that's what that means, that their, their accumulation every month will decrease this advance units balance, and then they can just start using it again up to 10. So if it goes down to five, then they have another five days to use. Now, if the district doesn't allow that, then they would leave that advance payoff, leave that off unchecked. So now it's only available once. Once they hit 10, the accumulations will not have any effect on that balance. Once they're done, they're done. So if they use it within one month and then it's the beginning of the fiscal year and it's August and they already use them, then they won't get any more sick leave until the new fiscal year or the next year starts over. Any questions on advanced sick leave on that payoff option? Okay, well, on to the next. The next one we're gonna look at is authentication and password requirement configuration. Again, this is up to the district how they want to set up their password. And again, this would, once they set this, this is going to be for all of the users in the district. So they're all going to be the same. So 
how many maximum length do they want, a minimum length, excuse me, in their password. I have eight set up, they could have nine. If they want it to make sure that nobody can ever get in it, they can do 10 or they just want five. It's up to the district. Again, is, it, is the district gonna require a mixed case? So are they gonna have a capital T and a, and a lowercase t? Um, or do they require, um, it doesn't matter. But if they require a mixed case, then they're gonna wanna put that in there. So they want uppercase and lowercase, so it makes it harder for an employee, another employee to figure out their password, they can do that. Does it require numeric? Do they want um, numbers to be in their file? So if they have it checked, then yes, and if they don't have it, no, then it can be all letters. And then password, um, how long do I want their passwords? I've, every 60 days they have to go in and reset their password? Is it every 90 days? Or they wanna do 120 so it doesn't reset? Um, and then the pre-expire password, this is if um, administrator, administrator resets a password for employee in the district. Do they want that password that they temporarily set up to expire as soon as the employee uses that password? And then they're gonna get a box saying, you must change your password. Or if they don't set that, then they won't get that message and that user can keep using that password. So, um, and also this doesn't affect anybody that has administrative roles. So this is just people that have um, the other roles that are probably underneath. Okay, any questions on a password reset or the setting up a password? Um, next one's simple, um, void message. Again, a district can enter if they have a void after 90 days, the checks are no longer good. If they don't check them or cash them, then they're void after 90 or they can do 60. Um, again, um, they can set up any message here. If they don't wanna do a void message on there, then they can just remove this, save it, and then won't be no message on the check. Okay, the next one we're gonna be going over is deferred absence posting. Um, again, what this allows for is districts, if they have it checked, um, they can defer posting of your attendance and input records for absences, like your sick vacation personal leave balances. So when they have this checked, this means when the deferred absent posting option, um, when they enter an AB entry for sick or vacation or PL, um, what it does then, it doesn't affect their current benefit balance, which is located under leaves. So it will not affect their leave balance at that time. So the transactions, So the transactions are flagged as being unposted as they are entered in attendance. So all that does is that it doesn't affect the balance and leaves at the time that they're in inputting them. But if they do want to update those leave balances at that time, then they would just leave the deferred absent posting unchecked and then save it. And, and also another thing, the deferred absent postings, um, this option does not affect any accumulation entries. So it's just your AB entries. Okay. On to the next is your EMI reporting configuration. Now this is set up pretty much if imported over from Classic, this is already in, um, set up, or if a new district comes in, then they would have to go in here and set this up. Um, the 2020 fiscal year, now this would have to be changed after the reporting staff course L window is open for the next coming year. So like this one is ready um, open for 2020. So once this one is 2020 is closed, then the districts will need to go in and update that to 2021. So they will have to make note to remember to do that under configuration. Um, the credential ID, like I said, would be, um, how are they reporting for the course records? Are they reporting by credential ID, employee ID, or the social security number? 
And again, this should already already be set up for districts that came over into redesign from Classic, but if it's the new district, then they will have to make sure they know what uh, EMIS um, wants them to do. And again, this is a district use or district of ZID. It's a prefix that for every district has their own number. And this would be found in their ZID number. So it would be Z E57 um, 01100. So this would be lo located actually in their ZID number. So every employee would have an E57 in their ZID number, but then the last five digits would be different. So when they're getting created, um, their ZID number. So I believe every school would have their own number here. It's usually an E and then maybe 51 is one district, another district might be 52. So, all right. So once you have that, you can just go ahead and save and we have our EMIS reporting configuration set up. Our next option is our email configuration. Um, here is, this is where you would need, if you're emailing um, using the employees that are doing the email direct deposits, um, would need your email configuration set up. Now, every district, um, everyone would have their own, like for mine, I have mine set up. Um, these are my test files, but I can show you how I have mine set up under mine. This is how I mine set up. So like your default administrative address um, would be like mine is fisco at nowaka.org. Um, your default address would be who is the employee? That would be the, the true email address of the sender. So that would be me. So I put in my beam at ssct-ohio. Um, a password, again, the password can be entered for um, if the district wants to use the password and they would know their password. Um, the port usually is not going to change. Usually that is going to always stay the same as 25, but it could be different. Again, your probably your I, tech department maybe would know that, um, or what the port should be. And then the SMTP host, um, that usually is like mine is called mx1.nawaka.org. And then the username would be, again, they can have a username. And again, the district employees would know that if they entered or using a username that they entered. I didn't put anything in there. I just leave my password and username um, blank. So this is how I had my, my set up and my test account um, for the emails. Is there any questions on the email configuration? Um, we do have more in, um, in the documentation um, to help set that up, um, exactly um, what it should be if, they, if you don't already have that set up. Okay. The next one is the email direct deposit no, um, configuration. So this is what you would need. If they're doing email direct deposits through, your, through the district, then they're going to make sure whoever's doing those email, um, setting up those direct deposits or sending them, they're going to want this address to be filled out with the email's address. So who are they coming from? So this would actually show on the direct deposit it came from me. Um, what is it for at direct deposit? And then the date will be inserted from the direct deposits. It knows to pick up that date for what that pay date is. And then this attached, and then there's a message in there. It's just attached in your email direct deposit notice for this pay date. And then you can go ahead and save that. And then again, you can add, they can add more body to it if they want, it is up to them. Okay. The next one is the employee number automatic generation configuration. So now if they want to start um, having the employees, um, their identification employee numbers created when they're creating employee 
and setting them up under core and under employee, then they would need to make sure that they do these steps first. So how, how do they want to in increment the employee ID number by one? So, so every new employee that comes in would be one. The next employee would probably be 100002, 100003. Um, again, it just depends how the district has and how they want set up. How many letters do they want the employee's last name to be included? So this one is set up as three, or you can do four. So the first four letters of their last name will be the first part of their employee ID number. And then what is the start value of the, of the number? So the increment would be anything from zero to 100. And then again, the letters can be zero to four. So up to four they can have of their last name. And then the start value, that can go from numerate value of zero to 999 million, I think it is. Um, so it just provides a starting number value of genera generating IDs. So what it's gonna do is going to generate the first four, and then it's going to do 0001. And then the next employee will be their first um, four letters of their last name, and then the next new employee will be 0002. So it just um, gets them started on a automatic generating the employee number for them so they don't have to manually do that when they're creating the new employee. So once they do that, they gotta make sure then they select, they check use imp IDs. So once that's checked, now the system knows I wanna use this configuration to automatically generate my employee numbers. So make sure all those steps are done um, in order for their new uh, employee numbers to start. Okay, so I'm gonna save that. So now that is ready to go. So when I have my new employee come in and I can enter them in core under employee and it will automatically generate that when I um, click save. Okay, and the employer retirement share option. So what this does to um, allows the districts to exclude or include employer distribution accounts now when they run their employee distribution reports. Um, this new, was a new option that was added um, probably a few months ago. So employee so employers uh, districts can uh, use um, employer distribution accounts or they cannot. So so if they want to include them in their reports, then they want to make sure this box is checked. So use only employer distribution accounts on the employee share reports. So yes. So this will only use accounts with employer distribution checked accounts that are located on the core payroll accounts. So in the core payroll accounts, if that box is checked, employer distribution, then this box knows, yes, include them. And where I'm talking about that is under payroll accounts. If you go to the payroll account then, this box right here. So those two would look for each other. Yes, if that if this box is checked, then yes, please include that account number if it was checked. So these two have to be checked. Now, if this box is um, unchecked and saved, then to exclude them, so accounts that are not set up under the employee distribution, so right here, so if this box isn't checked, then they will be excluded from the report. Okay, so, but if they want to include both the employer distribution and the non-employer distribution accounts on the reports, then just leave them unchecked. So if they want to include both the employer distribution and non-employer -distrib distribution accounts on the employer distribution files, which is under the USAS integration, then you also want to leave that unchecked. And we do have that in the documentation um, that shows those flags 
that if, if you want to include or exclude them, how should that flag be set? So, and again, if you have any questions on that, um, you can definitely please let us know. So is there any questions on that at the moment? Okay. On the next one is the fiscal um, year configuration. Um, again, this should be already set up for your districts um, when they come over from Classic. And also, if it's new and redesigned, then they just got to make sure um, is the district um, going by fiscal year begins in July or are they December calendar year? Um, I think but most districts are all on the fiscal year of July. The next one is ODGFS. Okay, so this one is something new that we have set up now that your districts um, are allowed to actually run the ODGS report and actually submit it to ERIC, which is the Employee Resource Information Center, um, on their own now. Um, and it doesn't have to be sent to the ITC to be included on a file and sent all together. Um, I don't know how many ITCs have um, started letting their districts do this, but that is an option out there for them now. So if this box wasn't checked and if I go to reports you see there's no option down here yet and then for order for them to see that and if the district ITC wants them to be able to do their own then they need to go back to the configuration go to ODGFS and click district will submit own file to ODGFS. That box has to be submitted or checked. You want to enter in the school name, transmitter title, or transmitter title name, and a phone number. Click save. Now when they go to reports in ODGFS, now this the fields will appear. So now the district has the option to actually submit that own file, generate it, and generate a submission file. And the, this ODGFS number, that actually comes over from the organization screen, which is located under the core option. It's located right under there. So that is where this number is getting pulled from. Okay. So that is how they get that to show and, and able to run for their own districts. Okay. On to the next. The um, payment printing configuration. This is the used to be located on the USP con screen on screen two. And this is where they would set up what what is the district going to allow to show on their check stub? How many pay amounts? How many payroll items is going to show? How many position pays are going to show on the um, pay stub or the direct deposit stub? So if they are still printing checks for employees, they're going to make sure they have this one set up and also the direct deposit. Now, if they're using their own form that maybe they created, they're going to want to go in here and, and, and check that if they have their own check form created or if they have their own direct deposit that they created. And then they're going to make sure they set those for what they want. Okay, will you review the direct deposit templates option? Um, what part of the template, direct deposit template, did you want shown? Oh, customize? Yes, they can, but that is probably going to have to be probably another time, like I, or intermediate, because that one is, um, that's going to, there's a lot of detail to that to show. Um, I can send you some um, information. Yes. Yes, I did. I did mention that um, because there is one that some districts are creating their own templates for their direct deposits um, but to actually to show how to do that would be 
um, probably more than what time the time we have at the moment to do. Um, but I definitely can send on, I can give you some information and on exactly how that is done. Um, so for sure, I will write that down that I will send that on to you. Okay, I'm interested. Okay. And I will send that on to you, um, some more information of how they can create their own and what templates um, are out there. Okay. So the next thing would be um, check use of overflow page, create an um, overflow page for the checks if your information does not fit on the stub. So again, you can have an option to have your first stub page and then an extra page, so the overflow. So if they don't have that checked, it's not going to print out an extra page and some of their stuff will be missing. Um, combined accrued wages and regular wages. Does the district want their combined accrued and regular wages to fit um, um, and to show all, all as regular wages? Or do they want that broke down on their pay stub to show accrued, what it was come out of accrued or came, um, what was paid into accrued or what um, reg part of their regular wages were? Okay. So that is the edit printing template for configuration. Um, the rounding configuration would be the account rounding threshold. So here you would do the first one would be anything for your pay accounts. Um, what is allowable amount to be charged to a pay account? Um, so 25 cents and under, it will be allowed and the system um, will allow that. What is the threshold for a payoff rounding threshold? What is allowable for that? for the contract. And again, this is up to the district of how they want to do that. And what is the unit amount decimal positions um, for new contracts? So when they're creating a new contract, what do they want their decimals to be? Three or two? And I have mine set up as three. And again, a district might want it to only be two to round up. So again, this is up to the district of how they want these thresholds set up. All right, um, all right, my 10.30 mark, which Lori is supposed to start 11.30, and we still have a lot to go through yet. So I'm gonna try, um, we might run over today a little bit. So, cause I don't kind of wanna rush through the stuff that we have to show. So um, the next one is the Esteris Advanced Configuration. Um, this will show what the current advanced amount will be. So again, this is for your class of people. This will be on your USP con screen on the second screen on the right, on the top right. And then this would be for the classic, this is where that payroll processing, this is where that is in classic. So the advance amount, so once they are in advance, this amount will um, show like 25,000 and then this will be checked. So this lets them know, are they in advance? Yes, they're still in advance. Then every time a payroll is ran, this amount will be added for the SDRS advance amount that was um, paid to STRS for those, um, those employees. It will keep adding. Now the advance amount will never go down, but these two should match. So they should be both 25,000 by the time they're out of advance, okay? So after the last pay, if the amount paid back is equal or greater than the advance amount, um, then the district will come out of advance and then this advance flag will be unchecked automatically. So when the advance flag on the configuration is unchecked then, then the amount paid back will always display as zero. So just remember, once the advance flag is unchecked, this advance um, paid back will be zero. It will automatically just go back to zero. If the amount paid back is less than the advance amount after the last pay, um, then what they can do, the, then the advance flag on the configuration will not be unchecked, and then they, um, that amount paid back will continue to show in the configuration. So the only way this advance amount flag is going to be unchecked is if these two equal. So they both show 25,000, then this will be unchecked automatically, and this will be um, to zero. Now, if they're wanting to see, so somehow that um, they want to see what the advance um, amount or the amount paid back was for some reason, um, you can check that advance amount flag again, and then that will bring up that amount paid back. 
But again, they just want to remember that they uncheck that if they were out of advance and they were just doing a check or something that they just want to double check something. They want to make sure that they can um, they, they want to make sure that, that that is on check before they move out of the screen, because if not, then they're going to have a series employees are still going to uh, be in advanced uh, mode. So they definitely want to make sure they uncheck that again. Um, can the amount paid back be adjusted? No, that is not adjustable. Okay, so um, if if these two don't balance by the last pay of the SRS advance and they're off, we do have the report, SRS, check, um, check SRS, where's that alt? Check SRS advance report. Why don't I see that? Oh, you know why? Because it's underneath home. Sorry. I remember where it is. Right there. So if they um, can't find, so this would be comparison to the Checksters report, Check SRS report that had from um, Classic. This is what is our report and redesign, uh, Checksters advance, and this will print out all the employees and show their amount for each payroll, what they were paid. And then from here, they can probably find out who is the employee maybe off that amount it will show. Okay. Um, the configuration STRS, um, the state minimum salary at this point is 30000 and that every year it could change, so we will make sure to let districts know, or this might be actually in a release, and that amount might get updated, So, but we will let you know. And then the URL will be... Um, this is the URL that it's sent to. So this is what, when they send the SRS advance to the SRS, this is just where this is going. That's just what the address means. So if it changes, then this is where we would need to change that, but this shouldn't have to change. Um, Sharon had a question, can the amount paid back be adjusted? But if the amount is only off a few cents due to a payoff not caught before, how we can get that amount off there? I don't know if we have an adjustment out there for checksters. Lori, do you know if you're out there, do you remember if we have that created to change that amount? And if that, and if not, Sharon, I will definitely write that down and I will ask the programmers on that. And let's see, a few cents left. Okay. All right, uh, good question. All right, you're welcome. And I will ask that. And I think Lori maybe is not on the line right now. Um, okay. The next one. Yeah, I just needed to unmute myself. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. So do, do you recall, do we have? adjustment where they can um, get that amount off of STRS in the configuration? I can't recall. They could. I mean, there's an adjust, it'd be a, the fiscal year amount. The like fiscal year amount would do that under the adjustment? There's an adjustment and you have to go to the, the uh, retirement payroll item. But no. For that employee? There no, there isn't because that uh -uh. basically is going to be on there. I don't think we have an adjustment for that, but I didn't think we could. I didn't think so. We could double talk with like Andy or whatever and make yeah. sure. Yeah, and we have a meeting yeah. today for Sprint, so we yeah. will. I will bring that up. Um, how do you the few cents if it's left? What? How do we adjust those off? Okay, thank you, Lori. Just yep. wanted to confirm that. All right, so our next one is. And USS, USS configuration. Okay, so what this is, <clears throat> this box actually won't show because um, it has to be actually added in the modules first. So right here, USS integration module. So if I change this back to plus and refresh, now you see here at the top, it disappeared. And it also disappeared from my configuration. Now I don't have it down here anymore. So 
in order to see that, we have to make sure in modules that this is actually changed and installed. And I refresh. And now my USAS integration um, tab is there. And also, it is located in my configuration. And I can open that up. Now, again, this is automatically populated from the system, so this should nothing has to be um, added or updated or touched. The only thing that they may want to check is if, if they just started coming on, um, schedule account sync nightly. And what this does then, if this is checked, is that the system will automatically try to check between USAS and, and payroll. Um, they will sync together and check for anything, um, any accounts that um, maybe have been created and USAS needs to see those. Um, it just, it just counts syncs nightly. So that can um, automatically be done and they don't have to worry about it. And when the morning when they come in, it's automatically done. Okay, so the configuration part is done. Is there any more questions on that side? Okay. Um, the custom field definitions, um, I kind of went through this on Monday or Tuesday a little bit, but I just wanted to kind of review for maybe people that weren't on um, and what, what else this can be used for. Um, the custom fields, you can, um, districts can create their own header titles or header fields, um, date fields, text fields, um, numbers, web addresses for emails. Um, Pretty much for anything that is listed here, they can actually modify these display names or they can add by creating new ones. So let's say I want to create a new field for um, background checks for, and I want this to be located in the um, employee option. Okay, so we would click create. What kind um, do I want to show? I want to create a date. So when the new person gets hired in and they do their background check, I want to know what date they um, did their background check. Which record do I want to show this under? Again, you can show this on any of the records. Employee, position, um, it, it, wherever you want, wherever the district would like this to show. And I'm going to keep it under the employee. So under a core and employee, in there, the date, I want to show if it's to that record. Okay, what is my display name? What do I want it to show? So I want it to show as back, background check. It's a date, which cannot be modified. What order do I want it to show? So I'll leave it zero for now so I can show you what that order means and where it will be placed. What does it apply to? It applies to the employee option under core. Is it active? So you can leave that, you can check it. So if it, um, um, a district is using this and they want it to show this one that they created, then they would leave this as active. So now it will show on the screen. It's actively being used. The property name, background check. So I'm just going to type in the property name. And where do I want this to show? I want it to show under dates. So like if we're under here, under employee, and then I go, I just bring up an employee here. And this will be for new employees and current employees. These are, that is that group that I was talking about. You need to know where do you want it to be, what group. Or you can create your own group. If you want to create a whole new section on its own, you can do that also. So pay total, state reporting, I want it to be under dates. Because this is where all my dates are. Okay. So I'm going to click save. And now, when I search for that display name, oh, sorry, you can actually search for display names. Why isn't it bringing it up now? There it goes. 
Um, I tried to search it by applies to, but I could not get the applies to actually search. So I just started using the background, like, I mean, typing in the display name and you can actually search it by that. So then I do have, it's out there. Are custom fields used across the application or only for a person that creates them? That would be for application all across. Okay, welcome. So now you would do, um, now that it's created, now I have to go into my employee. Go into employees. And then now my dates, and there's my background check. Now see how the sort number, I left it as zero. It just threw it in there right there in the beginning. Now like these dates here, you cannot modify like hire dates, birthday, you can't change those headers. And like I said, you'll be able to tell by the creator um, when you're in the system um, custom fields. Um, the one showing here is the ones you can, prop, you can modify. So now I'm, I'm gonna change that sort. I don't want that sort to be there in the beginning. I want it to be at the very end. So I'm going to edit that. And so, so I want it to be at the very end. So I'm just going to give it a high number of order and save it. And I'm going to go back to employee. And again, you might just have to play around with the sort order to get it to where you want, because I'm not sure how that system works of um, if what, um, how far like 200 puts it here at the end. So maybe 100 maybe would throw it somewhere in between here probably. So again, you might just have to play around with the number sort until you get it to where you want it to be. Um, so, but that's what that sort order number is. Where do I want it to be underneath dates? Where in this selection, in this list here? So, okay. Any questions on the system configuration or the custom field um, definition? And again, you can add these again for anything and actually, like I said, you can change the payroll display name. If you want to use those for something else, you can change all these payroll codes to something you want. It doesn't have to be payroll code one, two, three. You can change it to test for um, license number brought in or whatever a district would like. Okay. Um, the property name over here, what that is for is when you're doing custom report creator, that's what, when you, you create this, um, and then you go into your custom report creator, it will, you'll be able to um, find that property name um, option now underneath there. So you can actually create a report um, for this. So that's what, when you, when you put it in, um, like I just background um, check, you just go ahead and you just type that um, in there and it just has to be a lowercase and then um, capital and capital C. So the first one is always lowercase in your, your, in your name and it's all put together. So that's what that property name box is for. Okay, um, moving on to, I think that's it actually. Are we done? No, modules, sorry. Okay, so the next one is our modules. So our modules are anything um, that will show that it's available on the system and this is how we get these turned on. Like when I went in here to turn on the USS integration from here, that's how those modules will show on here. And if it's missing, it could be that the person doesn't have the rights to it or um, it just wasn't turned on um, in the beginning. So. Um, the, for the EMIS contractor module, um, this module would be to show the EMIS contractor. So if this wasn't turned on, they would not be able to see, and under EMIS entry, they would not be able to see these two fields. These two tabs would not be there. So that is what the EMIS contractor module is for. The email notification, 
that's for if the um, if that is it is turned on now and when I go to payroll payroll processing it turns on this tab here so when you're creating a payroll or the um, the past payrolls this would actually make this email direct deposit notification tab um, show up now so they would have to make sure they have that um, turned on the next one the employer distribution model module and the employer retirement share module if they did have these turned on you would not see these under reports. These two options would not be there. So in order for these to show under reports, this module has to be installed for both of them. Okay. And then also, for them to show there under reports and under here. So they will show the submissions. So in order to show those two, you have to make sure those two are installed. So they show under reports then, and then they will show under the submission. So those two would show up then too. Okay, the next, the file um, archive module, if this wasn't checked, you would not be able to see these two options. These two options would not show. So those are your file archive, and this is what uh, your when when you're running your payroll, closing monthly reports, calendar. This is where all that stuff will show. Um, the pay form archive that would be where your pay slips from your classic would come over from, and your W two archive is your W twos. So, um, so they want to make sure that's turned on. The next one is your leave projection module. Um, to, now that this is on, if it was not on, you, the, the leave projection report, which is under reports, would not show. So since I have it turned on, now this report is showing. Okay, and the leave projection submission file. So those two, once that is on and installed, then the reports will show and also the actual leave projection submission. The next one is the mass change option. And this one, um, once it's on, again, you're gonna be able to see that like in different options under core um, payroll items, You'll be able to see it um, once it's on and you go to the course, it will be always here on the left side. And again, that mass op change is kind of like a data tree procedure. So um, it's up to the ITCs if, or the district, if you want your districts to have that option or if you want to leave it just to you guys and you guys and leave it on check so they can't do the mass change and it's up to you guys to actually run that for them. So you do have that option and that's why we have this. So you can turn it off so districts can't use it. Okay, um, the next one is the UCS integration. And again, that was the one I did earlier. If I turned it off, then the UCS integration disappears. And that has to be installed and refreshed. And now you see that the UCS integration is now there. Okay. Um, the other one that was just recently added was the tax estimator module, and that one is listed under utilities. So in order to see that under utilities, you would have to make sure it's installed, like I have it installed. If it wasn't, then you would not be able to see that. And that's that new option that we have out there for the tax estimator. Okay, all right, so um, is there any questions on those three things that we went over for system menu? 
because then I will hand it over to Lori if we don't have any. And the questions that were out there, I will definitely ask um, and get back to you on those. Okay, can you hear me all right, Andrea? Everybody else? Can I you can hear you? hear you, yes. Why don't we take about five minutes so that way we can get uh, switched over and set up so I can get my stuff ready and.